Okay, welcome to chemistry today, guys. Before we get going, I want to help us kind of get set and see where we're at, see how we're moving forward. We're looking right here. Today we're talking about molecules. I just want to point out a couple things that we've got coming up. First of all, after today, we've got a practice day on the 28th, and then we have our test on the 2nd. So keep that in mind. Be prepared. Um, after today's class, you will know everything that you need to know to be able to take the test. You'll have seen it and have practiced it. Um, and then this day, we're going to get make sure you're ready for that. So take a look at the study guide. Be prepared. Come and ask questions. I'd love to help you out. And if I'm not around, Mr. Knappenberger would love to help you out as well. So we're here for you. I also want to point out that our quarter three deadline is next Friday at 2.15. So any missing labs, any missing activities, any tests you haven't yet taken, let's get that done by, by March 3rd. Okay, and then remember, any late homework for this unit needs to be turned in by the day of the test. So you'll want to make sure you get that in. The last thing I want to point out is this extra credit project. You have some opportunity for some extra credit this term as well. This extra credit will be uh, an at-home uh, kind of experiment that ties into things we've learned this term. There are a couple materials to gather and to purchase but the cost is very minimal on that. You can work with one other person on this, and that will be due on uh, the 3rd, on March 3rd. So take a look at it. All the instructions are here on this handout on the class calendar, and you are set. Okay, so that's it for calendaring. Let's take a look at what we're learning today. Today we are going to be talking about molecular names and formulas. That's the title of our discussion, because in the past, we've been looking at salts, right? A metal with a non-metal, and how to name salts and how to write formulas for salts. But now we are shifting things a bit, and we are going to be talking about molecules, right? We've been focusing on ionically bonded salts, like I said, combination of a metal with a non-metal or a polyatomic ion, right? They're stealing electrons. But now we are going to look at covalently bonded compounds. Remember, those are our shared electrons, right? Our shared valence electrons. We call these molecules. And guys, this is different. This is not a metal with a non-metal. When we're looking at molecules, we're looking at two non-metals. Remember, in our upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, this is where they are small and strong, and they are both trying to take electrons from the others, and they end up sharing very intensely, okay? with our two non-metals. Remember, hydrogen shows us that we've got a molecule, right? Because hydrogen is also small enough that it tends to share, unless it's a part of a polyatomic. If it is a part of a polyatomic ion, that is still going to be a salt, okay? Um, so if it's with one other non-metal, you've got a molecule. If it's a part of a polyatomic, like on our yellow sheet, that will be a salt. Okay. There's a couple of rules that we need to follow as we're working with molecules. Okay. Rather than looking at charges, because they're not stealing electrons, what we do is we use prefixes in the name. Prefixes in the name tell us how many atoms of each element are present inside the compound, which means we need to be aware of which prefixes they use. You're going to find these familiar. You've probably heard them before. Mono means one, like a monocle. It's only got one glass, right? Die means two, like in the dice that you roll. Usually you roll two dice. Not always, but usually, okay? Tri for three, like tricycle or triangle. Tetra is four, like Tetris. We've talked about this. Every single piece in Tetris has four blocks in it. That's why they call it Tetris. And some of you said you thought I was wrong, and I looked it up. And I'm right. Okay. Love that. Um, tetra, 4-4. Four, four, okay. Penta indicates 5, like a pentagon or the pentagon. Hexa indicates 6, like a hexagon. Hepta is 7, like a heptagon, right? Or was it Finding Dory that they had the heptopus because it had lost an arm, right? Hepta for 7. Speaking of 8... For octa, eight is octa, like octopus or octagon. Nine indicates 
uh, or sorry, nana or nana indicates nine, okay? And then deca is 10, just like in a decade. You are going to want to be able to know these, not just recognize them, but also be able to use them. So if these aren't already familiar with you, you'll want to practice it and get those down and then you're set, okay? Another rule that we use is this, when there's only one of the first atom, mono is not used. For example, CO2, carbon is my first atom and oxygen is my second one. So carbon only has one, but we're not gonna use mono because it's the first. That's why this is called carbon. And then di for two, dioxide, okay? But you'll see that in this guy right here where I've got one, again, if there's only one of the first one, it's just the name, you don't use mono, carbon. And then this one, because it's not the first one, that will use mono. And this will be carbon monoxide, okay? Now you'll notice that this could be written monoxide like that, or it could be written monoxide. It just looks a little funky to have the two O's together, so usually they'll drop it. If this first one starts start with a vowel, often they'll drop this part right here just to make it flow smoother. But if you don't do that, it's gonna be okay right now. Okay, so we use prefixes. Here they are. If there's only one of the first atom, mono is not used. And then just like in the example we just saw, the second atom ends in "-ide", like we've been doing. Okay, so those are the rules we're gonna follow. Let's try out a couple of examples. Uh, we're going to put these up. I'm just going to put these up for now. Using these formulas, we want to be able to write out the, the name of the formula. So I could look at each one and notice S and F. Both of them are nonmetals. They're both found in that upper right corner. So this is a molecule. I'm going to be using prefixes for this. Nitrogen and oxygen, both are nonmetals. We're going to use prefixes for this. Nitrogen and oxygen, again, in a different combination. Still both nonmetals, so we're going to use prefixes. We'll want to double check and make sure we know which set of rules we're using. Okay, so for this first one here, I look here and I see I've got one sulfur. But remember, because sulfur is my first one, I'm not going to use mono on this first one, and we'll just call it sulfur. I don't change the name of my first atom. Okay, then I look at um, my fluorine and I see that I've got six fluorines. So remind yourself, which is the prefix for six? I hope that hexa came to mind and this would be sulfur hexa fluoride. Okay, so we're gonna change that ending. It's not hexafluorine, we change it to ide, just like we've been doing. Okay, good, let's take a look at this example here. All right, I'm gonna draw it a little further down so I've got some space in here to write. Okay, this time here I look and I see I've got nitrogen here and there are two nitrogens. So think, is it, am I gonna use a prefix on this? And the answer is, Yes, we are going to include the prefix. You only drop this prefix, you only drop it if there's one of the first one. If there's more than one, you need to include it. So I'm gonna write dinitrogen to show that I've got two nitrogens. And then how many oxygens do I have? I've got one, okay? So think, am I gonna drop the prefix or am I gonna use it? In this case, we're gonna use the prefix because it's my second atom. So this would be monoxide, okay? And we can see that this prefix shows us that I've got one oxygen, and this prefix shows us I've got two nitrogens. Good? Okay, I bet you're ready. I bet you're ready for this last one. Let's try it out, okay? I look here and I can see that I've got one nitrogen. Right? I've only got one nitrogen. Think, are you going to use a prefix or not? And we are not because there's one of the first one. So I'm just going to write the name. Okay. And then I have two oxygens. So am I going to use the prefix? The answer is yes. We always use the prefix on the second atom. So this would be nitrogen di. 
oxide. Okay, and again, no prefix here shows me I've got one nitrogen. This prefix here shows me I've got two oxygens. Okay, I hope this helps you feel comfortable. I hope this helps you see how we can name it. It's pretty nice, right? We can just look and see one sulfur, six fluorines, two nitrogens, one oxygen, one nitrogen, two oxygens. The names tie really closely to these because of the prefixes. So it's pretty slick for molecules. If you remember the prefixes, you're in a good spot. It, again, if you don't know those, practice them. Practice them, practice them, practice them. Because if you know them, it really helps you see um, how this works and how this comes together. Okay. Not only do we want to be able to write the names, but we also want to be able to write the formulas. Okay. So we want to be able to go in the opposite direction from the name to the formula. But just like I showed you before, this is pretty slick because it's just in the name. Look, we've got our prefixes right here. Okay, so that prefix tells me how many of this one I have. This tells me I have two chlorines. So I just write Cl2. This prefix tells me I have eight oxygens. So I write O8. And then that's it. We got it. Here we can do the same thing. This prefix tells me I've got two nitrogens. Okay. This one tells me I've got four oxygens. And we are set. Okay. So again, it comes down to the prefixes. They are so important. They are so important. Okay. So get those prefixes down and then we're set. All right. So I hope that that's clear, molecular names and formulas, right? Then as we move forward, you might start to see things kind of like this, CuSO4, okay? And you can try it out. Take a second, think through how you would do this. Okay, now let's try this out, all right? So you might look at this and say, all right, well, I've got one copper, so this is, oh, but I can't say monocopper because it's the first one. So I'm just gonna call it copper. And then I've got one sulfur, so that's monosulfur. And then four oxygens, so that's tetraoxide, right? Okay. Now, some of us might be tempted to do that, but some of you are also thinking, wait, wait, hold on a second, hold on a second. This is not a molecule, right? This isn't a molecule. Guys, here I've got a metal with a polyatomic ion from our yellow chart, right? That little package there. This is not a molecule. It doesn't follow this pattern. Remember, we don't use prefixes for salts. We use charges, right? So then you'd think, oh good, that means I can just write the name. I can just call it copper. And then you look up SO4 on your, on your polyatomic ion sheet and you see that this is called sulfate. And then you think you're set, right? We're good. Okay. And then you realize that ah, that's not quite right either. Okay. That's not quite right either because copper can take multiple charges. It could be, what is it, two charges? I don't have my periodic table in front of me, honestly. It can take a couple of different charges. And that uh, is not an option. We can't just call it copper sulfate. We have to tell what the charge is by including a Roman numeral. All right, so let's go through that process. I'm going to erase these. Let's include a Roman numeral. Okay, I'm going to split this in between the positive and the negative side here, and we're going to use that negative side and we're going to work it backwards to figure out the charge for a positive side here. So sulfate has a charge of negative two, right? And remember, to figure this out, we're going to multiply, set it equal, and divide to figure out the individual charges. Okay, so if I go negative two, or yeah, negative two times four, that overall gives me a charge of negative eight. And then to set it equal and opposite, I make it positive eight over here. And then I'll divide that overall charge by how many coppers I have to figure out the charge of copper. So I go eight divided by one gives me an, a charge of plus eight. So that's copper eight sulfate. 
Okay. Now, again, some of you are probably shaking your heads because I did another thing that we need to watch out for, right? Right? Guys, remember, our polyatomics here stay in a package, right? They stick together, okay? So I'm not multiplying the 2 by the 4 because the 4 just tells me how many oxygens I have. I need to multiply this negative 2 by how many of this entire sulfate package I have. And I've only got one of these, right? So I'm going to actually go like this. I'm just going to erase this and start over. Okay. We know it's copper something sulfate, but what is it? Okay. We split it here, and I know it's negative 2. We're going to multiply, set it equal, and divide. Okay. And again, I have this package. I've only got one sulfate package, right? I could put a one here and show, hey, I've got only one package. So to figure out that overall negative charge, it's negative two times one, giving me an overall charge of negative two. I set it equal but opposite, positive two there, okay? And then I divide that overall charge by how many coppers I have. Positive two divided by one gives me a charge of two. So our final answer is copper two sulfate. And we arrived, okay. Now guys, there's a purpose to this. There was a reason why I went through four different mistakes before we got to the correct answer, okay? And the reason being is this. When, when you go into a lab or when you're working with chemicals, they don't tell you, hey, this is a molecule or hey, this is a salt. You need to be able to look at the name and figure out the formula based on your knowledge of if it is a salt or a molecule. Or you need to be able to look at a formula and then know what it is called, know what its name is, based on your knowledge of if it is a salt or a molecule. You can do all these things. We've been learning this for a while. You can do this. Now your job is to be able to keep track of when to do what. To help you with that, we uh, created some steps that can help you identify when to use which set of rules. And then you're gonna have some practice doing this, okay? So let's keep them straight, right? We know we've got our salts and we've got our molecules. That means the very first thing you need to do is identify whether you have a salt or a molecule in order to tell which set of rules to apply, okay? So the very first step is to look at the first atom in the compound. Look at the very first one you see. That if the first atom is a metal, you're working with a salt, right? If that first atom is a non-metal, you're working with a molecule, all right? Now let's remind ourselves, when we're dealing with names, right? When we're dealing with a name and we want to give it a name, if we first look at it and we say, oh, this first atom is a metal, that means that we are going to check the periodic table to see if it has more than one charge, right? And if it does have more than one charge, we're going to work it backwards so we can include the Roman numeral. And if it's not, we're just going to name it, right? We just write down their names, okay? Remember, that second element ends in ide. These are the ones that come from the periodic table, all right? And then our polyatomics, the ones on our yellow chart that have more than one atom in them, they end in eight or an eight, okay? So when you're doing this, you're gonna see something that looks like this, like what we just saw, and then you're gonna work towards its name, okay? So you'd see it like this, and we would say, all right, we just did this example, right? You'd look up and you'd see that copper has more than one possible charge, you'd split it in, in between the positive and the negative side, and you'd work it backwards to find that charge and then you would write out the name copper 2 sulfate, just like we just did, okay? Good, so that's what we do if it's a salt. If it is a molecule, then we're gonna use our prefixes, right? We will use our prefixes to show us the number of the atoms. And again, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca, we wanna get those down, right? The only tricky thing to remember is this, if there's only one of the first atom, not any other atom, but if there's only one of the first atom, we don't use mono, we don't write it. In every other case, we're going to use the prefix. 
Okay, and then the second element ends in "-ide", just like we did for salt. All right, so again, we want to keep those straight. We want to keep them straight. If you're using Roman numerals, you are not using prefixes. If you're using prefixes, you are not using Roman numerals. All right, an example is this, right? If you see this, then you're going to say, okay, we got to name this. We would write it out carbon dioxide, right? To write out its name. Good. All right, if we're writing the formulas, okay, and we look and we see that the first atom is a metal, that means we're dealing with a salt, okay? That's when we need to follow the steps of getting the abbreviations and the charges. This is when we're working with charges. This is when we're working with oxidation states, okay? Remember, our polyatomics end in eight or eight. Those are from our yellow chart. This is when you're going to find the least common multiple to see where they balance out. And where they balance out shows you how many of each ion you're going to use. Good? And then the only time you use parentheses is if you have more than one polyatomic ion. All right? So salts work with charges. Salts work with charges because they're stealing electrons, okay? So you might see an example like this, iron 2 nitrate, okay? You'd grab their abbreviations and charges, Fe2+, plus, and nitrate, NO3-1. minus one. Okay, I got that from the yellow chart. Then we're going to look at this and you're going to think, all right, if this is plus 2 and this is minus 1, how many irons do I need? How many nitrates do I need? If you can do that in your head, fantastic. If you can't, that's when you're going to start to list out these least common multiples and see where they match. Oh, look, that's where they balance out. So that tells me I need one iron and one, two nitrates. Okay, and I would end up with one iron. And because I need two of my polyatomic, I would put that in parentheses like this. Okay, so that's the process I'm talking about with writing formulas here. Okay, so if it's a salt, if the first atom is a metal, we're looking at charges. Okay, if it's a molecule, we are just looking at the prefixes, right? Molecules are just prefix prefixes, and then we use the formulas to write the subscripts. Our example is dicarbon tetraoxide. So di means two, so I've got two carbons. Tetra means four, so I've got four oxygens, and then there's salt. That would be my answer. Okay, Guys, this is your summary. This is everything you're going to see. So you're going to see this, and you want to make sure that you can do every single one of these, but also that you can look and tell when to do what. Okay, so for example, the first page of the homework looks like this. We're just naming molecules. This first section is just molecules. Remind yourself, when you're dealing with molecules, are you dealing with charges and Roman numerals or prefixes? Okay. For molecules, you're looking at prefixes. So this page will go real fast. On the second and third page, it looks more like this. And you'll notice here, it's mixed. It's mixed ionic or covalent. So the very first step that you need to do is identify, is it ionic, which is a salt? Or is it covalent, which is a molecule? Okay, that will help you identify which set of rules to do. You do not need to write down salt and then name it. You can just figure out if it's a salt or molecule, and then what you will write is the name. Down here, you'll figure out if it's a salt or molecule, and then what you'll write is the formula. Okay, you'll be practicing like this for the last two, the last two pages. Okay. Um, guys, check your answers as you go. See what questions you have. For the homework today, we're going to do the odds. So you're doing one, three, five. You're going to do the odds through each of these. Uh, if you need more practice, go ahead and do the evens. And then you've got this. Okay, I hope that helped out. If you have questions, I'd love to answer them. Reach out or pop by during flex or pop by and see Mr. Knappenberger. He would love to help you as well. Thank you so much. Then you got this. See ya.